Hi, this is Tim and Dole. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. A podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and being a steward of the land. Nose Jammer contains vanillin and other natural aromatic compounds that have the ability to effectively jam an animal's sense of smell. Just like an overly bright light can wash out a photographic image, Nose Jammer overwhelms the olfactory system and overpowers an animal's ability to detect and track human scent. Hunting in the wrong wind? Jam them with Nose Jammer. Iowa Missouri Hybrids has been a family-owned business since the 1930s, Located in historic Keosauqua, Iowa, Aaron and his team are a one-stop shop for farmers, hunters, and landowners. For your conservation program, CRP, food plots, and all planting needs, give Aaron at IMH a call and tell him the two dumbasses sent you. Welcome to Midwest Hunting Outdoors by two dumbasses. Uh, Tim, we've got some special guests and however, veteran special guests, right? Absolutely. So we've got Rachel Rudin and uh, Tyler Harms from the DNR. How are you guys? Great. Good. Thank you for having us. Tyler, I'm just going to adjust your mic here for you so we can hear you. Appreciate it. Um, it's uh, hunting season here in Iowa. I'm like, like, if not yesterday, today's like the number one day to kill a rutting buck in Iowa. It's roughly no November 8th. So thank you for coming down to the uh, Two Dumbass Cabin and spending some time with us. But um, today we're going to talk about testing for CWD. So not only testing, but we're going to do a demo here in a little bit about what sample of organs and materials we need to collect. How do we do it? Um, if I'm a hunter, I shoot a deer and I want to um, test it for CWD, you know, what's the process to do that? So hopefully this is a one-stop shop for our listeners that... If you have questions about CWD, especially in your deer, that you can walk away from this episode and, and uh, know what you're doing. Is that fair? Sounds yeah, great. That's awesome. the plan. Yeah, awesome. we've, we've been talking about doing this for quite some time. So it's, it's good that we were finally able to get everybody coordinated to do this because I think this will be a big value for folks. And I think the timing, correct me if I'm wrong from the DNR standpoint, that the majority of deer are killed during shotgun season, which is coming up in a month. And uh, that's really when you guys do the majority of your testing, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. About 50% of our harvest happens during the first three weeks in December in those shotgun seasons. And so that's really when we do our big push from, a, from our surveillance program standpoint for chronic wasting disease. Yeah, so I've got some work to do to kill a deer and then go back to the editing room and get this done and get it out before, uh, you know, so the timing's perfect on it. Absolutely. But no pressure, absolutely. Tyler, yeah. no pressure. All right, so let's, let's start with, I, I just shot a deer. A doe, a buck, a fawn, it can be any, first of all, it can be any any deer, correct? Correct. correct. So, yeah. yeah, the mechanism that uh, we'll use to test it might be different, but yeah, anything is eligible for CWD testing. And just to clarify for everyone, CWD is chronic wasting disease. Um, it's a very unique and specific uh, pathogen um, or disease causing agent that we deal with here in Iowa. Well, not only in Iowa, but I mean, it's a, unfortunately, it's, it's, it came into Iowa from other, other states. It's a, it's a problem across the board, mm -hmm. right? So, okay, so I, sh I shot a, a deer. And uh, so what, what do you want me to do? What, what do I do as a hunter to get this deer tested for CWD? Yeah, that's a good question, Joel. So um, I might start with just kind of explaining a couple reasons for why we want to test these deer, right? Okay. So. In my mind, there's essentially two really important reasons for why we want to get our deer tested for chronic wasting disease. One is one of which is for I say us as the DNR for our surveillance program, but really we're we're doing this for for your deer herd, right? Um, and then also from from your standpoint as a hunter, um, it's important to get that animal tested too. So chronic wasting disease surveillance it's something that we do in the state every year. We've been doing it since 2002, uh, when the disease was first detected in Wisconsin. Um, and we collect samples statewide from every county in the state every year. Um, we're collecting tissue samples from harvested deer primarily, although we do collect some samples from roadkill as well. 
uh, and we have a certain number of samples that we want to get in different parts of the state depending on uh, the risk that we feel might be of, of chronic wasting disease being there. So obviously in, in northeast Iowa, down here in south central Iowa, and Wayne and Appanoose counties, uh, both really high priority areas because both are areas where we've detected the disease in the wild. And so we're, we're focusing our surveillance efforts in, in those areas, but we also look at risks in other part of, parts of the state too. And these are risks that have been documented or at least thought, thought to be um, associated with the spread of chronic wasting disease. So we're collecting samples. We have quotas in every county of the state and we're collecting samples to fill those quotas to help us essentially monitor the spread of the disease in Iowa because early early detection is really critical for the effective management of this disease. We want to do our best to pick up the disease when it's just first getting established because that gives us the best chance to get in and manage the population to help slow the spread of the disease. So surveillance program is one really important um, part of, of sampling. The other important part for you as a hunter is in order for you to make informed consumption decisions and by that we mean that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which everybody's familiar with the CDC now, especially here in the last year, year and a half, um, they've, they've issued guidance or recommendations that said that hunters, hunt, especially hunters hunting in areas where CWD is found in the wild, uh, that they get their, uh, their animal tested for the disease. And if that the animal does test positive, they recommend not consuming the venison. So again, really another second kind of really important uh, piece or factor when, when sampling uh, for this disease is that especially if you're in those areas where we know we have CWD in the wild, uh, it'd be an important component of, of your hunt in order to make that informed consumption decision. Awesome. Awesome. So 2002. That's when we first started. Wow. Yeah. So we've collected... What we're approaching, we're approaching 90,000 samples statewide since 2002 we've collected. Oh, wow. So and how many, how many counties? Every single county in the state. How many counties are we positive? Ten. Ten. Yep. Ten in the wild. Yep. Um, and so I guess I would say, um, so oftentimes those two objectives, you know, our need for um, samples to fill those quotas and then, you know, people's interest in maybe knowing if their deer is positive, especially... Um, in areas where we do have positives, we have higher quotas. Um, so we have more of a need for, for testing. And that's to get a kind of a different question of um, the prevalence or how much, how many of those deer in those areas are positive. So that kind of d explains why, you know, in central Iowa, in Story County or Boone, we have low or lower quotas um, because we haven't had detection. So there's nothing to really, we're, we're looking for it, but there's nothing to really track in terms of how our management is affecting um, the amount of disease on the landscape. Um, but so early in the season, you know, those objectives perfectly align. But as you get later in the season, as our quotas start filling, um, it gets, it might be harder to find one that's open, you know, to get your, your deer in to get tested. And that's where um, in 2019, we actually opened this hunter submission pathway through Iowa State Pet Diagnostic Laboratory. Um, and we still get all that information out those deer, should there be a positive um, sample that come through. Um, but it's a way for people that have reached, you know, in their local areas, they've, they're at capacity, there's no longer that surveillance kind of avenue for testing, that they can still get their deer tested and make those informed consumption decisions. Um, and just based on, you know, different risk factors, you know, there's certain classes of animals like you know, your highest risk animal to test positive is going to be your adult buck, and then it kind of steps down from there. So a fawn, while it can still be, it can still test positive and it could still, you know, affect whether you want to eat it or not, um, we're not going to focus on those fawns because it's just, it's less likely, they've had shorter amount of time on the landscape, they're less likely to have been exposed yet. Um, so there's kind of, that's where those uh, objectives sometimes um, don't perfectly align, where we have our surveillance objectives and then people might have, you know, increasingly these different um, questions related to CWD testing. Now, is there a special form if I decide to send in a sample for my deer to fill out to get this testing? Yeah. So... Um, you can get it at your local DNR unit. Um, they're familiar with the pathway. You can get it online on our website. Um, we have a hunter submission pathway kind of um, web page. Um, you can download it, and there's um, instructions too on how to fill out that form. Um, you know, it's asking a lot of the same things that we'll collect in person when we're you know taking the sample for our surveillance quotas. 
Um, so, you know, age, sex, uh, location, you know, as closely as we can in case we need to follow up and, you know, should it test positive. Um, so we'll have access to all that information through this form, um, but it is kind of its own separate entity. So, you know, we'll help you take the sample, though hopefully after this video, you know how to take your own sample. Um, and, you know, we're, we're happy to ship in those samples, um, but it's just this, this own way for you to be able to still have access to testing when we no longer, you know, need your sample. Um, and that, that does have a charge associated with it. So it's $25, um, which is, you know, exactly what the DNR is paying to for each one of the samples we test. So now the data that comes from us as private, private hunters that submit, submit for these tests, does that help the D Iowa DNR too? Do you get those sample results as well? Yeah, we do. And, and, and those data are extremely helpful. And so what, what we often, um, the, the, the pieces of those data that are most important for us are the, obviously the location of where it was harvested, uh, because if the, if, um, the deer were to come back as positive for chronic wasting disease, that location is really important because that, that kind of directs us on where, where we need to go to start looking harder and where we might need to go to, to start implementing some of these management activities. Right. Um, we also are really interested in the age and the sex of the animal, because as, as Rachel mentioned, uh, we know that, that different ages and sexes have different levels of risk um, to, of getting the disease, and that's primarily behavioral. Again, CWD is spread via direct contact between um, animals. And so, you know, what do we know about, about adult bucks, especially this time of year? Yep. They're roaming around, they're moving a lot, they're coming in contact with a lot of, of animals and a lot of, of, of fluids associated with, with animals Licking as well. branches. Exactly. Scrapes. Exactly. Yeah. Whatnot. Exactly. Who knows what they are putting in their mouths, like a toddler. Huh? That's right. They've yeah. got one thing on their mind this time of exactly. year, right? And so, so those pieces of data are really important too, because then that allows us to track prevalence in different segments of the population, and then also allows us to kind of better... Um, come up with surveillance quotas and things like that. So on the data piece, you know, I know you're, I don't know what this report looks like. So, you know, other than, Hey, positive or negative, um, CWD in your sample that you sent in, is there other information that you might get, um, from this testing? Again, an innocent question, age to the deer, you know, in any, any genetic, any genetic information, anything like that, that comes back in the report. Yeah, so this is this is pretty you know tailored. We're just looking for one question: Does your deer have CWD? And it will re be reported as positive if it were to have those infectious prions detected in that lymph node sample or not detected. So there isn't a negative, um, and some of that has to do with the types of testing, um, the sensitivity of the tests, meaning um, you know they they can detect it at a certain level, but not necessarily. Um, at the earliest stages of disease. So for those reasons, it's reported as not detected or positive. Um, okay, yeah. fair. I just, you know, it's uh, yeah. inter and then, interesting. You know, working with your, you know, if you're working with the DNR unit, they can tell you, you know, age and, you know, sex might be obvious. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, having, you know, an uh, antler or not, that kind of thing. But I'm hoping. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping. But for, you know, and, and we categorize them. So fawn, yearling, adult. So um, some of our staff will be able to age it out you know by the almost to the exact year you know of adulthood um but for our purposes we're just looking at those kind of broader age classes okay excellent okay so tyler what is from a state standpoint what is you know if i get a positive hit on the sample that i send into the dnr what is the dnr doing in these counties to uh, address the, the CWD issue in those locations? Yeah, that's a great question, Joel. So the, so the first thing that we do whenever we get a positive sample in an area is we establish what's called a disease management zone around that positive location. And what that does, at least initially, is it, it provides us a zone where we wanna go in and look a little bit harder. Um, you know, one positive, is a problem, uh, but what we want to know is: is there is there more positives that that we're potentially missing with our surveillance in this area? Um, if we pick up more, then we start talking about management management actions. Uh, but until we pick up that second positive in that area, it's basically just we need to go in here and look harder. 
We need to sample more deer. Uh, and, and that's what we do. If we get that second positive, then, then we move into more of a, uh, we're still looking hard, uh, but we also transition into kind of a management approach where we're going to start to, to um, look at where the population is relative to our goals for that area and, and try to manage that population at the low end of that population goal to help slow the spread of the disease. Uh, so I think the common misbelief that we, you know, that we hear, Joel, is that, you know, the DNR is going to come in and they're, they're going to wipe out all the deer. And that is not at all what, what we're planning to do. Will we increase harvest? Oftentimes we do, uh, but we want to reduce those densities, but then still provide them at a, or manage them at a, at a level at which we still have a quality recreational experience for our hunters, but that we can try to minimize that spread as much as possible. Yeah, that makes sense. Rachel, anything to add to that? It sounds like there's two paths to send my sample in. I can mm -hmm. take it to, and this is the preferred path, is to take it to a DNR post. Is that what you're kind of calling yep. it, an office? Yep. And that could be a, a central office in Boone, or it could be, you know, my local DNR office. That's, that's probably going to be the most likely. Yeah, venues. your local unit. Unit, unit headquarters. headquarters tends to be what, yeah. what we're talking about. And, and then they're gonna we're gonna sample it together. They're gonna or I'll do it, and yep. but we're gonna get it. We're gonna send the samples in through them. And I, yeah, so I was gonna say, so we have two different paths here. And quite honestly, I mean, I think this video is good because it shows people how they can do it themselves if they wanted to. But really, I think both paths start with go to your local DNR office because whether that sample goes into our surveillance program or whether it gets submitted to Iowa State on your behalf both of those paths are going to result in our staff helping you collect that sample and kind of walk you through the process from there. Okay. Okay. Yep. So yeah. So yeah. So the, just for like the background, the reason the hunter submission pathway came into being is because, um, as we start to become more efficient and hopefully effective in managing, um, and surveilling for CWD, we no longer need like, you know, 8,000 samples from across the state. Now we can really target our efforts and, and, you know, focus on areas where we can have an effect. And so we don't need to know every deer that might test positive in like the core of Alma Key, uh, but we want enough that we can estimate a good prevalence. Um, but that starts to get into conflict. You know, people who have been submitting their samples because they also get to know if their deer is positive, whether they want to eat it or not. Um, it kind of leaves some people at some point it will leave some people, you know, without, you know, like a, a place to submit their samples. So that's what this pathway is, is that those people who are still interested, but maybe not from our surveillance objectives, um, that can still get their, their deer tested. So that's a smart idea. It's kind of like a, yeah, growing pains because obviously uh, in the beginning, everyone got their deer tested and we were just like, you know, begging for samples. And now it's transitioning into this phase of, you know, we don't need every single deer. We just need certain deer and for a certain purpose. So. Sure. Yeah, you mentioned, Rachel, earlier that I would have never thought of is people going out of state to, to hunt elk or bear mm -hmm. or whatever and uh, bringing this sample back and wanted, wanted it to be tested to know if it's uh, CWD positive or not. So Yeah, so it's, and interesting. It's, it's similar, you know, there's similar CWD surveillance quotas in other states too. So I would always direct someone to check with their, with that state's, you know, local, um, you know, management unit um, to see if they're interested in the sample because then that's the free opportunity. But, you know, if you need the the hunter submission pathway that's that will always be there to support our you know our hunters yep yeah good yeah, that's great good do we want to kind of just verbally kind of talk through the steps um of the demo that our mm -hmm. audience is going to see here um in a little bit mm -hmm. is that kind of where we're at uh, logically yeah that's, so that's i started about 25 minutes ago saying okay i shot this deer right <laughs> i got this deer what uh kind of walk me through the steps and i don't think I know I can't hear this enough as far as the steps. I, um, I know we're going to see it in the demo, but um, I, I think it'll help. So step one. Uh, uh, orient your deer so you have access to its neck. <laughs> okay, so I got my deer, and uh, the glands I'm looking for are going to be located on the bottom side of yeah, the Yeah, they'll the be neck on the and... underside. So what you want to do is you'll feel along the margin of the mandible or the lower jaw. Um, feel to the, the far edge, so right as it's, you know, 
connecting to the neck. And then I usually make my cut about an inch behind that, just because it's a little hard to see, you know, what's the, the straight kind of perpendicular line. So um, I end up about an inch past that, uh, the end of the lower jaw. Um, and then you're going to cut down and you'll see the trachea. So the trachea is the windpipe. You'll feel that cartilage um, that is that creates the trachea. You'll see it, so it should look like a ring. And once you've kind of cut through that ring, you should be about deep enough. So a lot of times it'll be on the outside, it'll be about the, the level of the ears. Um, but once you really get through that trachea, you should be far enough to kind of orient and then figure out where your sample's gonna be. Um, depending on how you know far up or down you make that initial cut, you might be a little nervous the first time. So you might go further down because you're scared you're gonna miss it. Uh, you might be too far then to see it. So don't be scared to make a closer cut that's gonna be kind of right behind that jawline um, because it'll just you'll be fishing down kind of a, a dark tunnel <laughs> if you're too far down the neck. Um, so once you're close to the jaw, you'll see what's called the larynx um, and specifically the epiglottis, which will be a flap of tissue that will be kind of facing out at you. It's, it's kind of like a triangle or almost like a tongue really. And it, it kind of has a glandular appearance um, itself, but it's underlied with cartilage. Um, so it'll be kind of tan, um, cartilage, and kind of attached to where the trachea continues, but kind of further up. And that's where, that's right in that plane where you see the epiglottis and that larynx that you're going to start looking for your lymph node sample. So I'll continue, but do you have anything to add, Tyler? No, that's perfect. And as, as Rachel just mentioned, so we're looking for the retropharyngeal lymph nodes, which are the lymph nodes that are basically right, right here. If you're feeling like you're getting sick yourself, you can kind of just feel around in your neck right there and, and feel those little balls getting swollen. That, those are the lymph nodes that we're taking from these deer. Yeah, so, so then kind of what I do is you'll have the external kind of the skin and the muscle, and then you'll see where that larynx is. And it's just kind of this almost triangular window that you'll start teasing um, your fingers through to kind of see if you can uh, find a blueberry or a hemal node, um, a lot of times colloquially called a blueberry. And that is going to be, you know, there'll be, maybe there'll just be one. Sometimes there's none, which uh, makes it a little more challenging. But if you can find that blueberry up front, you kind of know exactly where you need to start targeting. And then you can kind of tease away with your fingers, um, feel in there. And if you kind of follow the blueberry deep into that tissue, kind of right on the side of the, the larynx or that cartilage that we talked about, um, you'll feel something that's firmer, that has a little more integrity to it. A lot of the stuff in there and the tissue um, is gonna be soft and kind of um, gooey. pliable, gooey sometimes. Um, if it's frozen, of course, everything, the textures are gonna be kind of all different. Um, but the lymph node itself is something that if you were to pull on it, it's not gonna just pull apart. Um, it would be, take quite a bit of force um, to get that uh, that lymph node to really break apart. So you can feel around it and you can tug pretty hard once you kind of feel that massive tissue um, and be pretty confident you're not going to compromise your sample. Um, so the best thing you can do is kind of look in there. So once you've kind of moved all the tissue around, um, you've kind of isolated that lymph node, you're going to see it. It'll look, I would say it looks like translucent, like a um, like a water balloon, um, that kind of texture where you can see the tissue almost like pushing out um, through what you're looking at. Um, and that's going to be your other kind of diagnostic feature. So you followed the blueberry, you kind of went in, you isolated that that mass that's kind of has a firmer texture, um, more integrity to that tissue. You see that it looks like a water balloon. And then, you know, you might be able to just continue teasing away and, and uh, remove it from the from the neck or you can use your knife and kind of um, you know do the rest of the the way once you've kind of seen what you're looking for um, and found it so you do that on one side you do it on the other we call that the a and the b lymph node and we only want one of those tissues so you're gonna hold on um, you know if you're if especially if you're using our hunter submission pathway you're gonna hold on to that um, that other sample um, and then submit one of those. Um, if you're using our surveillance pathway, um, we're actually going to hold on to the other tissue sample and then submit one of those lymph nodes. So the, the secondary s sample is, is kind of like a backup if something would happen or questions on the testing, you get another th identical sample to go back and Exactly. And if, you know, as other research projects come up, like genetic questions and 
um, you know, other trying to improve our diagnostic testing for CWD, we actually use those B lymph nodes um, oftentimes for these other kind of questions that come up that we might not be able to predict at the time, but we're very happy to have um, in retrospect. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Interesting. One thing I wanted to mention um, that Rachel um, brought up during her explanation there is so the timing. Uh, and, and something that I've experienced uh, in the samples that I've collected now is that it is really beneficial to try to collect that sample, you know, fairly quickly after harvest, um, certainly before the, the animal freezes. Uh, and the reason for that is because it really allows you, you know, a lot of it's by feel as, as, as Rachel described. And, and um, when it's fresh, it, it does really provide a nice opportunity to, it makes it easier to find those lymph nodes. Um, obviously that's going to get to be a little bit more challenging as we get later in the season here and the temperatures get colder outside. But, um, you know, certainly if the, if the animal's been frozen and thawed, it's, it, we can still get samples that way. But, uh, but what I found is that, you know, freshly harvested deer, it, it, it is very easy to kind of distinguish between those different types of tissues uh, when you're feeling around in there. Yeah, having experienced the demo myself here, it would, it would, I could imagine, couldn't imagine how hard it would be if it's like frozen stiff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So a little less stinky than the samples stinky. we had. That's but, the uh, truth. So is that, is that all the steps? So, so yeah, uh, I guess I would say we kind of sure. left you with the, the samples. You know, you have one that you're holding on to in a, a plastic bag, a Ziploc baggie. Um, you sent in your other sample with the paperwork um, that we're going to gonna show you how to fill out. Um, and then you can use your registration number to actually look up that sample. Um, if you're within our surveillance quota and then the hunter submission pathway, you'll actually get a direct email or correspondence, however you um, requested. So if it's by, you know, regular mail, um, you'll get it in the mail or email um, once the results are ready. So that's really slick. So what if I'm fortunate enough to get a large deer? I, I'm, I'm probably not going to be interested in slicing down the jaw. So how would you recommend me getting a sample if I'm so fortunate? Yeah, that's a good question, Tim. And I'm glad you asked. I was thinking about that earlier when we were walking through the process. The best thing that we've recommended with folks is just work with your taxidermist if, if that's the route that you're going to go. Um, you know, oftentimes taxidermists, they're, they're doing the work up there anywhere when they're caping out the animal. Um, some taxidermists may pull that sample for you. Uh, at the very least, what we've found is that uh, there are taxidermists that will at least save, save the necessary tissues back in order for you to obtain uh, that sample later. And, and we do have a number of taxidermists across the state that we work with in getting uh, sample from from animals again because a lot of the animals that go to taxidermists are those adult bucks right and mm -hmm. those are the ones that we know are the highest risk for for having the disease so really important samples for us from a surveillance standpoint for okay. sure good good to know cool well i don't uh, any questions any additional questions you got i mean it no. sounds like a pretty solid procedure and sounds like you've been doing it i'm assuming it's adapted over time from 2002 but uh yeah, we used to use brain, um, the the kind of the back of the brain, the brain stem, um, <laughs> called the obex, um, to sample, and and we found that the retropharyngeal lymph node actually allows for earlier detection. Huh. Um, so it, the prions, if a deer were to be infected, they'll congregate um, or accumulate in that tissue first, um, and eventually get to the brain, and then lead to maybe those clinical signs that we think of with CWD, but. Um, yeah, so as, as the science improves, you know, our process improves as well. A little easier access to Much simpler extraction <laughs> yeah, process. I, I can yes. only imagine. You know, only I, imagine. I'm pretty excited to get to see how to do this. Uh, the one last thing I think we ought to say before we move into the demo is how do we dispose of our carcass when we're done? I think it's important we talk that real quick. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, sure. So, you know, our, our top recommendation would be if your local landfill accepts carcasses um, to use that pathway because um, that, you know, we know that it's going off the landscape, it's going to one concentrated location. Um, that's not always possible. Uh, so kind of where we go next is uh, to 
leave the carcass at the site of harvest. So, you know, if you're harvesting in Northeast and coming back to South Central, we definitely don't want to get that carcass, you know, that might have prion uh, contamination out on the landscape to seed another, um, area. you know, local area that's positive. So um, just proper disposal, um, that might look like um, having a burial pit on that property of harvest and, and disposing of it there um, or letting it uh, lie um, on that property. Okay. Good. Safe. Yep. Yeah. Good. Well, with that, I want to thank you guys for uh, coming down again to the Two Dumbass Cabin and spending time with us and Tyler setting records of being the uh, most frequent guest uh, on our podcast. But For sure. Rachel, you're getting close here. You're uh, halfway there. But uh, really do appreciate your guys' uh, time and knowledge and, uh, you know, showing us in the audience how to collect these samples. Super important. Yeah, thanks for having us out. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. But with that. As always. As always. Be safe. Be safe. Have fun. fun and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors. Established in 1934, Pete and Shorty's is located on Main Street, Clarksville, Iowa. Pete and Shorty's is famous for their half-pound burgers, hand-breaded tenderloins, and homemade pizza. The beer is always cold, and the Bloody Marys are the best in town. Stop in and tell Mike and Amy that the two dumbasses sent you. Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be, be safe, safe, have, have fun, fun, and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors.